confrontation requires confirmation. And what do I mean by that? I mean, this ain't something that somebody, somebody's cousin, uncle, who's kin to your third cousin on your mama's side. You ain't hearing this three or four times, you know, down the line. This is something that you know. This is not hearsay. That's why he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 19. Listen to what, what it says. Deuteronomy 19 verse 14. He says, You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark, which the ancestors have set your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land of the Lord, that the Lord your God gives to you. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 19. He says, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. In other words, somebody could just randomly say, you know what, Brother Andre did this. That, that, that wouldn't happen. He goes on to say, if, and here's why, if a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both of the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. Verse 18, the judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witnesses, if the witness is false, is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. You see that? If you accuse somebody, if you falsely accuse somebody, if you, if you were trying to dig a grave for someone, the grave that you were digging would actually be your own. That's why he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 19. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So it's not a rush to punishment, but a rush to purity. And biblical confrontation requires confirmation. That means that you're not just listening to gossip, that you know this to be a fact. Amen? I remember some time ago, we had something going on, and, and basically what I did is uh, I scheduled a meeting with a person and, and with two people, and they actually didn't know that they were going to be meeting, so we just watched it right in. And so the one person that was saying, this person said this, I put him in the same room, and guess what? He died right there in the room. I didn't say that. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, well, then it's, then it's no big deal then. So we're done. Let's pray. Let's, so I don't want to hear about this no more. And never heard about it again. Confrontation requires confirmation. And by the way, listen, don't, don't be the type of person that always has your ear open to gossip. Some of y'all are not sharing a whole lot, but you, you show no thing. I ain't one to talk, right?
the church must be willing to address sin. That's found in verse 16. This brings me to point number four. The church as a whole must participate in dealing with sin in the camp. Look at verse 17. Let me go back to 15 again. He says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And as taking these two witnesses also helps them to understand the seriousness of what they're doing and the seriousness of the stance of the church. And so it goes on to say, if he refuses to listen to the two, the, the additional people that you take along, he says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Remember, the church is a pillar and the support of what? The truth. He says, tell it to the church. And if he, re if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now this is where the rubber meets the road. If a brother or a sister is living in sin and they are unrepentant about living in their sin, it says you go to them first, if they respond, you want your brother. You don't need to, you don't need to tell nobody about it. If they don't respond, then you take one or two more. So that's a maximum of three people. You're not taking like eight people, gang up on them, you're going to obey or, or, or we're going to beat you down. It's two or three people who got, and by the way, if you're going to take somebody along, take somebody that's, that's spiritually minded. Take somebody that's a hothead. Uh, let them say something. I'm going to smack you right now.
and, and pastors won't even ask them where you're coming from and, and so on and so forth because that's just one more number that they have. One more possible giver. And so you allow sin, the sin of, of one congregation to transfer to another congregation with the hopes of getting some money out of it. Listen, you need to understand that it doesn't matter where you go. If you are under God's discipline, there's no, just like Jonah. Listen, Jonah went to, to, uh, to Tarsus in the total opposite direction that God wanted him to go, but he was still under God's discipline. Do you understand that? You can't escape God's discipline. You can hide, but you, you, you can't run. Or you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> So when someone is not responding to the first person or the two or three people, then the church needs to be informed. Now, you got to understand that we're in Matthew chapter 18. At this time, the church, the Holy Spirit has not fallen on the day of Pentecost. There is there's not a, uh, I, I would say, legalized a church structure at this point, I don't believe. But I'm going to assume, based on um, the pastoral epistles, that they were establishing churches, certainly with elders and deacons. Those are the two offices that you see all through the New Testament as it relates to the church. And so, when a unrepentant brother or sister is not responding to the discipline, the one or and then the one or two, then the church must be informed about that behavior. In verse 17 again, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, I just want to make a note also that you understand the authority that God has given to the church. Don't miss that. Notice that I'm not saying God has given authority to the pastor. Even though he has put me in an accountable relationship, he's given me a stewardship, but the stewardship is not only for me, it is for the church. Do y'all get that? He says, if you don't listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. So A, 4A, the church must be informed about the behavior that threatens the unity and the purity of the church. B, rebellious members must be separated from the body. Now, 2 Corinthians, I mean 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Rebellious members must be separated. Verse 2 again, he says, You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who did, who had done this deed, without, uh, would be removed from your midst. Paul saying, This person should have been removed from your midst. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, says it this way. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Keep away from them. If someone is living a sinful lifestyle and they are goes on to say in verse 11 for we, are, we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life doing no work at all but acting like busybodies now such persons we commit and exhort in the Lord Jesus to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread but as for you brethren do not grow weary in doing good Verse 14, 
If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet you do, he says, yet do not regard 